So dear Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to sing to you this morning, to lift our voices to you, O oh Lord, as we declare that you are enough for us. And Lord, I pray that indeed you will be enough for us, that our focus will be on you, that you will satisfy our deepest needs. You are the one who truly satisfies our deepest needs. Lord, as we open your word, we pray that it will encourage us, it will challenge us, it will enrich our lives. Lord, I pray that you'll meet us in uh, a very point of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. There was once a man who went to the cemetery and... Uh, he was mourning his wife, and uh, he was there at the, at the grave, and he was crying. He was deeply wounded and deeply empty, and he was crying, saying, Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? Why did you have to die? And then there was a man who came and consoled him and asked him, Is that your wife? He said, No, that's actually my wife's first husband. <laughs> we have been preaching on uh, some of you will get it after 10 seconds <laughs> we have been preaching on adultery, divorce and remarriage and in today's text we explore the agony of divorce but also the um, God's beautiful intent for marriage now, if you're joining us for the first time or you haven't been to church in a long time, you are welcome. Uh, I'm glad that you are here. My name is Kinua, and I have the privilege of bringing to us God's word. And welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Now, let me just catch you on on the journey that we have been on. We have been preaching through the Sermon on the Mount, and somewhere Jesus uh, makes a mistake and he talks about divorce, adultery, and remarriage. Those are hot button topics that you'd rather avoid. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 to 32, uh, we, Jesus talks about those things, but in brief. So what we decided to do, because those are hot button topics, we are just going to extend this someone series. And so we went to Luke, Luke chapter 7, uh, and last week we were in Matthew chapter 5, and today we are in Matthew chapter 19. And next week, uh, we get to go to Luke, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I have titled my sermon, this sermon series, Love, Lust, and Liberation. Jesus on adultery, divorce, and remarriage. Now, it's not only a hot button topic, but it also makes us very uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but it can feel uncomfortable preaching about this and talking about this. And it's uncomfortable because there are deep emotions that are involved. Either you have gone through divorce and it has deeply hurt you, or you are a child, a son, or a daughter who has painfully watched your parents go through a divorce. You remember the times when you were tossed, be tossed between one house to another, or when one parent set you against the other parent. As a child of divorced parents, maybe you at one point blamed yourself for their divorce and have had to battle negative self-esteem. Or years later, you are very skeptical about the institution of marriage because you're still trying to work through the pain and the confusion and the betrayal. And also sometimes you forget that the parents of the husband and the man and the wife and the lady who are going through divorce, the parents also do really feel the pain of their son or their daughter who is going through it. And at times as a grandparent, what you're going to do is that you maybe are going to be the one who's going to raise your grandkids. Now, You also ask yourself, what happens to the kids? Who has custody of the kids? 
uh, are you willing, if you're the one who's going through the divorce, are you willing to see another man raise your kids? There's an impact of divorce on friendships. Maybe as a couple, you had this group of friends, but then now you almost choose. Your friends have to choose. Do I be with John or Jennifer? Or probably you are coming to church and you're wondering, what will people say to me when I walk through those doors? Then there's an impact on assets and property. And those are just a few examples of the impact of divorce. So I, I recognize that this and acknowledge that this is, can be a very emotive someone. And so I hope that the Lord is going to speak to us even as I bring God's word, hopefully in a compassionate way. Uh, this topic is important for all of us. For those who are going to get married one day, hopefully you are looking forward to get married. You need to know about God's idea of marriage and divorce. For those who are married, I hope that this encourages you and that you have a deeper and better understanding of marriage. And I hope that this strengthens your marriage. For those who have been through a divorce, I hope you experience God's healing through this. And I hope that for all of us, that we build biblical convictions and get practical wisdom as we go through this. But the reality is that considering how broad and emotive this topic is, I will not be able to cover everything, even though we have done like it's going to be eventually a five-part someone series. Next week, we will be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. You can go ahead and read it. But then the following week, we will have a Q and A, and, and a Sunday. So I'll do a summary of uh, this uh, someone series. But I'll leave most of my preaching time for question and answer. So you can get to ask the minister questions as regards to adultery, divorce, and remarriage. And here's how we're, we're going to do it. Uh, please email me. That's my email address. Also in uh, the newsletter, uh, the, my email address is right at the back. So you can email me. But if you want to remain anonymous, uh, you can email the office and um, Jamie is going to collect those emails and then print out the questions for me. Or you can write it down and put it in the offering box. Uh, please do that this week uh, and also Sunday next week. So that on um, uh, the, the following Monday, I'll pick the questions and go through them. And then I get to answer those questions. The reality is also for me is that this, I, I'm also learning a lot. Uh, and so I would need some time to a few days to read and and um, uh, hopefully serve you in a way that is that is good for you and brings glory to the Lord. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Kapai? Yeah. Cool. Cool. So send forth your emails. <laughs> Let us read Matthew 19, 1 to 12. Um, and I've titled this someone's, someone, Is It Lawful? When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you heard? He replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, 
Dude, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. And Jesus replied, calm down. Now, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who chose to live like eunuchs, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, the one who can accept this should accept it. Let's pause for a moment and pray. Dear Lord, I, I, <clears throat> I acknowledge that this, this is a hard, hard topic, hard to accept, hard to understand. So Lord, by your spirit, may you open our hearts and minds um, that we would see what you want us to see and hear what you want us to hear. That would be encouraged, challenged, and stretched so that we may grow in being devoted followers of Christ. We pray that we'll, that you'll bring renewal to our relationships, to our marriages, to our families. Moved by your spirit to bring healing where there's been brokenness, hope where there's been desperation, joy where there's been sorrow, and clarity where there's been confusion. We pray this for our good and your glory, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Now, there's a lot I could say, but what I'm going to simply do is walk us through this text, and then when time is up, I'm going to finish, and then we'll pick it up from next week. Actually, that's a bait so that you can come back next week uh, and hear what, uh, what is more now. Let me just give us some uh, background. What is happening here? It starts with this statement. When Jesus had finished these things, what are these things? Uh, this is Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus had been addressing another hard topic. It's a topic on forgiveness. He, he, and it's very interesting how most, uh, Matthew writes this. It's, it's more or less like he's preparing us for this harder topic. So he's just talked about forgiveness almost preparing us to talk about this hard topic of marriage and divorce. So, when Jesus had finished these things, he left an area called Galilee. So here is a map of, of the map that time. So he has left Galilee and then and went down to the region of Judea, or to the left side, on the other side of the Jordan. So this river over here is a Jordan, and... Jesus went to this side. Some of your translations will be very clear. They'll say he went to Perea or the left side or the east, the east side of uh, Jerusalem. Some fun facts. Jesus had a cousin. It's called John the Baptist. You know that guy? John the Baptist, um, just before this text, had been beheaded. It's, the story is in Matthew chapter 14. What had happened is that uh, John the Baptist used to do ministry around this area, okay? Exactly where Jesus is. That was his stomping ground. But also what was happening around this area, those, the leader of this area, let's call him the mayor, Tetrarch is the right word, um, he was called Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas had decided that uh, he did not like his wife and decided to marry the wife of his brother. He had a brother called Philip, who had a wife called Herodias. So he decided to marry Herodias. John the Baptist was very, gave very strong condemnations to this act of incest. And so there is, here is John talking about against the divorce and remarriage of this well-known Roman leader. Everyone knew John. Everyone knew this story. And then Jesus goes to this very region and he talks about divorce and marriage. The stage is set for a showdown. And then there are the Pharisees who don't like Jesus. They are not his number one fans. And they decide, you know what? Here's an opportunity for us to trap 
Jesus. And the scripture is very clear. They wanted to trap Jesus. He has gone to this place. There is a crowd. And so if we trap him, we'll get him. So, how will it go down? Verse 3, it says, um, if I can have this going. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? The Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus by having him choose ideas of a theological controversy. Now, if you're here last week, I'm going to repeat a few things from last week uh, based on Matthew chapter 5 and verse 31 to 32. You remember I said there were two schools of thoughts ab about uh, divorce that was based on Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her and, keep, and happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanliness, please note that word, in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of the house. This was the issue. The question is, what does an uncleanliness mean? And there was a rabbi called Shammai who said that uncleanliness can be interpreted as sexual immorality. Okay, so it was a more conservative view. And then there was another, more, you'd say, liberal view by a guy called Rabbi Hillel who interpreted uncleanliness as anything that displeased a husband. And anything that displeased a husband encompassed the following. If the wife cooked a bad dinner, it was grounds for him to divorce. If uh, it was valid for a husband to divorce his wife, if she spoke to another man on the street. It was valid for a husband to divorce his wife if she spoke disrespectfully about his parents in his presence. It was valid for a husband to divorce his wife if she spoke in an argumentative way, more likely in a loud voice such that the neighbors could hear, him, could hear her. It was considered a valid reason to divorce his wife if he found someone else prettier who pleased him better. So there are those two schools of thought. Who do you think people liked more? This one, exactly. And so this is what is happening in the background as these Pharisees are asking these questions. They are wondering who will Jesus side with? Rabbi uh, Sh 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 Shammai or Hillel? If Jesus said that divorce was lawful for any and every reason, he would be contradicting Moses, who permitted divorce only for sexual immorality. But if he said it was unlawful, it would be very unpopular with the crowd because divorce was commonplace in those times. So it was a lose-lose situation for Jesus. Or was it? <clears throat> so back to the text. This is how Jesus answered. They asked him a question, and he answered with a question. This is actually a rhetorical question. He's actually being very cynical. Remember, the Pharisees are people who knew the law of Moses. More or less, they had not just, uh, they had crammed Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And so Jesus is like, by the way, you fellas, you are clever. But haven't you heard what it says in chapter 1 of Genesis? Haven't you heard what it is written in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and what is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24? Haven't you heard? I mean, you guys are learned. You should know these things. Haven't you heard, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they, the two, will become one flesh. Like, guys, I thought you were learning. 
He is directly quoting Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. What Jesus does, he bypasses the law of Moses and goes to God's original intention. Jesus focused on marriage rather than for, uh, on divorce. He pointed out that God intended marriage to be permanent and gave the reasons of its importance. Basically, what Jesus is saying, you cannot understand God, what God says about divorce until you understand what he says about marriage. Now, fellas, as for those of you who are followers of Christ, if you love Jesus and believe in him, what he did and what he said, we must take his words seriously. You see, Jesus here quotes the creation account as being factual, and he's he doesn't give a tentative answer. He does not second guess. He just says it as it is. And Jesus affirms that marriage is God's idea, not a human invention. From the creation account, Jesus also affirms that marriage is monogamous, lifelong, covenantal relationship between a man and a woman, and that is what God blesses. And from the rest of the Bible, we learn that marriage is a gift from God, which provides a holy and blessed context for husband and wife to encourage each other's love for God, to develop their love for each other, to enjoy sexual intercourse, and to begin a natural family life if and when God provides children. But we all know that we live in a different world. Today, many sex attracted same sex attracted people want to commit to marry with the blessing of the church. And some Christians are pushing for it. I'm really keen on the Christians here. Because we say that we love Jesus Christ, we believe in him, then, then we should take Jesus' words seriously. Reasons for same sex, and, and I need to say this carefully and slowly, reasons for same sex feelings and desires, they are complex and serious. And as Christians, we should not trivialize that situation or be flippant in condemning same sex attracted people. We need to be compassionate, genuinely love, but we do not compromise biblical truths. We do not compromise biblical truths. Why? Because Jesus made God's ideal very plain. At creation, he approved one kind of marriage between a man and a woman. They became one flesh, one blessed of the Lord. That is what God blesses. If you are interested in this topic, here is a book, simple book that I would recommend. Or you can go on YouTube and watch those lectures by a guy called Sam Albury. It's a question, uh, it's, it's in the form of a question, is God anti-gay? And he's actually, he bases his argument from Matthew chapter 19, verse 1 to 12. So please go and have a look at it. God created man and woman. Heterosexual monogamy is God's plan for marriage. The best plan, the only one. Jesus continues to state that the goal of marriage is to become one. That is a lifelong process of becoming one flesh under God, growing closer to each other as we grow closer to God. Then he continues. The text continues. It's interesting how Jesus is very clear. He has taken them back to Genesis, but they are insisting on going back to what Moses said. Why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Actually, Jesus is more or less telling them, you know, don't get it twisted. He, Moses did not command. Moses permitted. 
you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. And I just want to pause there for a moment. See, what was happening there in that context is, was that um, it was a man's world and women were really downtrodden to the extent that you remember the reasons that men gave to divorce? And so at will, men would divorce, but at times there were, there were men who decide not to give a certificate of divorce to leave you in your turmoil while I, the man, go ahead and still remarry. So I don't leave you, you're not free to remarry according to, to the law, but I can. And so what Moses does, he gives permission so as that there is a sense of freedom and a little more freedom for the women because it was really unfair for the women. Because of Moses' law, a man could no longer just throw his wife out. He had to write a formal letter of dismissal. It made them think twice about divorce. But even then, men would either frivolously dish out a certificate so that they can move on to the next woman or refuse to give a certificate so as to make life hard to the women. And Jesus says, See, your hearts are hard. And then gave, gives this exemption of sexual immorality. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, Jeremiah says this of the state of the heart, of the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things beyond cure. Who can understand it? In Matthew chapter 13, verse 15, Jesus says, For the people's hearts had become callous, hard. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I will heal them. Again, Matthew 15, 19 to 20 talks about the state of the heart. For it is from within a person's heart that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Remember, as we were going through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is really interested in our hearts. He says, this is a letter of the law, but this is a spirit of the law. I do not want you to lose that because your hearts can easily get hard. And I pray that our hearts will be tender towards him and sensitive to his spirit. That if our hearts become If our hearts are callous, we are desensitized to our sin. And here's a big one in verse 9. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, that is the exception that Jesus gives. A simple interpretation of this is that where there is sexual immorality, Jesus allows for divorce and by implication, remarriage. And I've said a simple interpretation. It was interesting, as I've been researching on this, uh, uh, theologians don't quite agree. There's no, this. so the likes of jo uh, um, John MacArthur, he says, yes, it's possible. There's that exception. Then you have John Piper who says, no, once you get married, there's no remarriage. And there are, pro there are, there are reasons for that. The word used to refer to sexual immorality, as I said last week, is pornea, where you get the word pornography. Pornea is a broad term that includes sexual activity beyond the basic act of sexual intercourse. It includes adultery, polygamy, polyandry, orgies, homosexuality, any sexual activity beyond the bonds of marriage 
between a man and a woman. And another thing to note is how that word ponea has been used in this context is almost suggesting a repeated and repented sexual activity outside marriage. It's a result of a hard heart, our hard hearts. The hard heart leads to sexual immorality that leads to divorce. The permission to divorce is a concession due to the effects of sin. Divorce is a concession to a human weakness to allow it. Not, it's not the same as a, it's not commanded. And as I said last week, I know of couples that have done the hard work of forgiving one another and gone through years of healing. It's possible to forgive, but it will probably take a long time for healing to happen. The Lord can repair marriages, and I have seen marriages repaired and renewed, and those marriages coming out stronger, a living testimony of a God who brings reconciliation even in the hardest of situations, if both parties are willing to submit to God and to forgive one another and to seek biblical counsel. Maybe you're hearing this teaching and thinking, I was once divorced. My first divorce was unbiblical, but now I have married again. What do I do? Do I divorce my current spouse and go back to my first spouse? I would say no. I believe God is, is a God of second chances and a, a God who's gracious. A God who says, come, let us reason together. A God who invites us to come as we are. But he loves us so much, not for us to stay as we are, because he wants to transform us and change us. He wants to come where, from where you are at and start from where you are at. If they sin in the past, take it to the cross and get it right with God first. And then right now, in your family and marriage situation, surrender it to the Lord so that God can work his good, great, and glorious work in and through you. My great-grandfather was the first one to be a Christian in his village. But he was polygamous. So he's re he received Christ as Lord and Savior, went back home, talked to his wives. He had five wives and many, many, many kids and grandkids. And many of all his wives and many of his kids surrendered their lives to Christ. And the following Sunday, he went to church with his family. Now, the missionary was a little bit confused. What do I do with this guy? Do I tell him to divorce his wives and stick to his first wife? Then what happens to the kids? Do you see how complex this matter can become? But I believe that we can come to the Lord as we are and allow him, surrender our hard hearts to him, that he may make our hearts tender so that he can speak to us and we accept his correction and his rebuke and his challenge and his encouragement. And there are many other exceptions and what do we do? What if I'm in this kind of situation? What if I'm in this kind of situation? Bring it to the Lord and seek biblical wise counsel. Now, I don't want this to be a hostage situation, so I better wrap this up. Um, if you are interested in my notes, I am happy to send this to you. But let, me, let me close it this way. Um, I'll finish the sermon next week. If you're married, whether to your first or your second wife, or your first or second spouse, well, let the Lord use you for his glory. Serve the Lord with your marriage. Surrender it to the Lord. 
let the Lord use you. And may your desire be to bring glory to the Lord. Endeavor to grow in love with God and with each other. If there's any sin to be repented, reconciliation to be done, bring it to the cross of Christ. Are you single right now? Embrace the season that you're in. Serve the Lord in your singleness. Are you a widow or widower? Serve the Lord as you are. And if you are living with an unbelieving spouse, love and serve like Jesus did. And I pray that you point your spouse to the Lord. Friends, God's mercy is greater than our sins. Let us together finish by reading this together. Um, let's read this together. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a Holy Spirit to sustain me. So, dear Lord, we need you. We need you in our lives. We need you in our marriages. We need you in our families. We need you in our relationships. We confess that we have hard hearts. Our tendency is to go our way, to make excuses, to justify our sin. But Lord, I pray that by your spirit, you'll make our hearts tender, sensitive to your spirit, as you nudge us, as you correct us, as you rebuke us, as you encourage us. Lord, I pray for each one of us here that we'll be open to your leading, open to your voice, I pray for especially those ones who are Christians and followers of Christ. I pray, O oh Lord, that their desire will be to give all glory to you and their desire will be to please you in all that they say and do, especially in their relationships. And probably you are here, you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And probably this was a hard teaching or you have gone through so much pain because of divorce or you have been the one who has caused the divorce and the pain i commend to you jesus christ he's not only the one who gives us his truth but he's also gracious Would you want to surrender your life to Christ and start afresh with him? If you're here and you want to surrender your life to Christ, please come and see me after the service. I'd love to take you through this. And so Lord, may you bless every family and every marriage represented here. May the families and marriages flourish for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.